Here we go. Knock, knock. We call this meeting to order the Temecula City Council meeting. Matthew Costa, stand up and take a bow. Lovely music this evening. I'd ask everybody to stand for our flag sal uh, salute given by um, Chris Meyer. Chris, come on up to the podium. Uh, actually, um, let's start off with a, uh, stay there. We're, we're gonna start off with an invocation first. Uh, uh, Pastor Wrench, are you here? Come on up, Pastor. And then Mr. Meyer will give us the flag salute. Pastor, always a pleasure, sir. Right, good to see you. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this season of the year when we honor our veterans. We appreciate so much the sacrifices that have been made by so many to provide for us the freedoms that we enjoy. And Father, we're also thankful for this season of the year when our thoughts are turned to the giving of thanks for the abundance and the blessings and the bounty which we all enjoy here in this great country of ours. And Lord, we are prone to complain about little things and big things and prone to be people that look toward uh, those things that catch our attention. But Father, we pray that in this season of the year as we approach Thanksgiving that uh, you'd help us to recognize more all the things that we have to be grateful to you for. And Father, we are grateful among other things, for our city, for our leaders in our city, and the uh, great work that they do as our representatives. We pray your continued blessing on them. We ask that you would guide them as they uh, enter into the business of the city tonight and consider various uh, proposals and needs and responsibilities. And I ask that you'd give wisdom to all the folks that are involved and direct their thoughts and and uh, we pray that uh, our actions would be pleasing to Thee. Uh, we ask also, Lord, that You'd bless our veterans and those that have served on our behalf in the, in the uh, defense of our country. And we pray that You'd be with those on foreign fields that are standing for the cause of liberty. We know that we live in troubled times, but we pray, Father, that You'd uh, have Your hand upon those and with those who are not uh, here tonight. And we ask that you'd bless the proceedings. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Chris, come on up. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God bless you. Please be seated. Madam City Clerk, can we have a roll call? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Edwards? Here. Councilmember Ron? Here. Councilmember Schwank? Here. Councilmember Stewart? Here. Mayor Nagar? Mayor is here. This is a time for presentations and proclamations. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart's going to help me out by going down to the podium. Um, First, uh, I see Linda Mejia in the, in the audience. Come on up, Linda. Presentation and proclamation for our 19th, wow, it's been that many, 19th annual Community Candlelight oh, Tribute. I can't, I can't believe it. Mr. Stewart, would you please? All right. The, commu uh, the communities of Temecula, Marietta, Lake Elsinore, Wildemar, and Menifee in the region of the Southwest Riverside County have come together for the 19th annual Community Candlelight Tribute to recognize a holiday, a special holiday celebration for remembering those we've loved and lost. And especially during the holidays of Thanksgiving and Christmas, just as all year long, we dearly miss and grieve their loss and honor them with special occasion and time of remembrance. And over the past 18 years of this event, each one has been, has been the focus of difficult and specific tribute to military, victims of 9-11, parents of children, first responders, and terminal illness. This year we focus on tra the tragedy of the loss, the losing a loved one uh, from drinking and driving. The five communities have collectively suffered 
and grieved over multiple losses in, uh, from drinking and driving. And citizens have formed alliances and partnerships to form strong bonds of concerned citizens as in the group Do It to bring greater awareness to our leaders, law enforcement, and first responders, and the founders of the annual Community Candlelight Tribute are hoping to spread the good news of the need to support, love, and comfort the bereaved families of the past and recent losses associated with negligence of driving when intoxicated by alcohol, drugs, or any other substance that can cause deep, uh, that which can cause deep, deepest of sadness and loss. I'm Michael S. Nagar on behalf of the city, of, city Council of the City of Temecula hereby proclaim November 30th, 2019, the 19th annual Community Candlelight Tribute Remembering Those We've Lost to be held at the Temecula Civic Center front steps on Saturday, November 30th and encourage all cit citizens of the communities of Temecula, Marietta, Lake Elsinore, Wildemar, and Menifee to come and participate in this important time of healing to benefit the harmony, welfare, emotional well-being, and mental health of our cities, county, and families. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> Linda, would you and like I've to say- And I've known all three of these ladies for like a long, long, long Have time. You? So, Linda, would you like to say a few words? A few words. Yeah. First of all, I would say I'm very thankful to live in the beautiful city of Temecula. I love Temecula, and my 30th anniversary here will be next year. <laughs> this is a hard time of year, Thanksgiving, Christmas, time to celebrate and give thanks. And we are thankful for all the blessings. Even the blessings of heartache can bring good things out of it. And the DUI task team is one of those good things that's coming out of it from this year's theme. I would like to introduce two ladies that are with me. Um, I, here on this side is uh, Diane Hoffman. She's with 102.5 The Vine radio station, a wonderful new Christian radio station in our community. And she is going to be taking the baton from me. I am handing her the event and I'm sure that it's gonna to go to a new level. I'd also like to introduce Karen Harkey. Uh, John and Karen Harkey are the parents of Autumn Harkey, who died a few years ago, and she has a little piece to read to you about her story. Thank you for listening. First of all, I just really wanna thank my bestest friend, Linda, for doing such an amazing, beautiful job all these years, and it really has been wonderful serving with her. So, little did I know that I would be sharing this story with all of you tonight. On May 5th of this year, I was driving my grandson, grandson's friend home from a baseball game at about 7.30 p.m. here in Temecula. Out of the blue, I was hit by a drunk driver going 88 miles per hour head on. My car was totaled, I sustained life-threatening injuries, and was in rehab for 20 days, and I'm still recovering. My grandson had a fractured uh, sternum and pelvis. His friend was airlifted to Radies, San Diego, with serious injuries. Today, by the grace of God, they're fine. And yes, it's a miracle, and I thank God that we're alive. The driver in our accident, <laughs> is a serious offender, has prior convictions, one being a felony DUI conviction in 2018. I'm sad but thankful that Linda thought of addressing this issue for our candlelight remembrance this year and for the DUI IT committee that has been formed to try to do something about drunk driving, not only in Temecula, but the state of California, which I've been told has some of the most lenient DUI laws in the country. As I'm finding out, many, many others have suffered death and tragic stories, just like ours. For such a time as this, 
May we all join together in whatever capacity to help deter and change what is happening too often to innocent people on our nation's highways. Thank you very much for your time. Thank very you, good. ladies. Our next presentation is a certificate of recognition to Isabel Madrigal, 2019 National Gold Award, Gold Award winner with the Girl Scouts. Isabella, right. welcome. All right, the city of Temecula is proud to recognize Isabel Madrigal for receiving the 2019 National Gold Award Girl Scout. Each year, 10 Girl Scout seniors and ambassadors who choose gold pro award projects demonstrate leadership in creating solutions to local, national, and global issues are chosen as National Gold Award Girl Scouts. For her project, Isabel, a member of the Kuiya tribe, authored, directed, and performed Mendel and Her Heart, a play about indigenous women in order to shine light on violence against Native American women. Isabel received a $5,000 scholarship to produce the play, uh, which has been performed at Indian Child Welfare Act Conference at Paula Casino and several schools and locations in Southern California. And she received an additional grant to continue performing the play this year. We congratulate Isabella for being selected to receive the special honor and wish her continued success in her future accomplishments. Wow. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Only 10 in the whole country? Yeah. Do you want to say anything? Um, Talk about your play yeah, okay. for a second. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Isabella. And um, yeah, so this past, it's been about a year now, I've been involved in writing this play, Menyil and Her Heart, and it follows the disappearance of a young Kauia girl and the efforts of her sister to find her, and it has this kind of element of magical realism where she enters into these traditional stories. So this project was very much about cultural revitalization and storytelling, and I think that's something that's very potent right now, um, sharing untold stories, and so that's where I really saw that this project could fill this gap. Um, and because of this project, I've been raising awareness for this underrepresented issue of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Before this project, I really, I had no idea that 84% of native women will experience violence in their lifetimes or that they go missing and are murdered at rates 10 times higher than the national average or that 95% of these cases go undocumented and unreported by national news media. You know, legislation has failed because it doesn't exist. And so my play was all about kind of bringing awareness and I've been lucky enough to be able to work with really incredibly talented professionals and community members in, in bringing this play up and down Southern California. And I was uh, recently able to speak at the United Nations about the work of the play and, and about this issue. So. It's, it's been an incredible experience and, and extremely rewarding to be able to share these stories in this way. So thank you for having me tonight. Wow. I forgot to mention, Isabella, that that pin is the very first one we've handed out to a Girl Scout. We've never done it to the, uh, in the city of Temecula. So you've got the very first one. So. Very good. Yeah. Our next certificate of recognition is for Cindy Marina, Miss Universe Albania. Wow. wow. Okay, the city of Temecula is proud to recognize Cindy Marina for being crowned Miss Universe Albania. She graduated from Great Oak High School in 2016, where she played volleyball and was nominated as All-American and California Gatorade Player of the Year. Wow. <laughs> um, after high school, Cindy attended Duke University, where she joined the women's volleyball team and was named to uh, Atlantic Coast Conference All-Freshman Team. 
Cindy transferred to the University of Southern California, Los Angeles, majoring in international relations, global business, and is a member of Pi Beta Phi mm -hmm. sorority mm -hmm. and settle, uh, setter for oh setter for the USC Trojans vol uh, women's volleyball team. Cindy is also a member of the Albania women's volleyball team and is the youngest player ever to play for the country's national team and played in the 2018 Women's European Volleyball League in Budapest, Hungary. Cindy is an Albanian-American model. Uh, being, uh, began modeling at the age of 14. She is the first American-born woman to ever win the title of Miss Universe Albania and will represent Albania in the 2019 Miss Universe pageant in South Korea in December. We congratulate Cindy for being selected to receive this pre prestigious title and wish her continued success in her future endeavors. Hi everyone, I am Cindy Marina. I am so honored to be here tonight and I want to thank the city of Temecula for inviting me and giving me this certificate of recognition. I grew up in Temecula. Uh, we moved here from Chicago in when I was, I think, eight years old in the second grade. So I've grown up going to school in Temecula. I went to Great Oak High School, played for the volleyball team, and I've been in the community for most of my life now. So to be able to come back and receive this award really means a lot to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so this has been such a huge accomplishment in my life so far, and being able to represent the country that my parents grew up in and you know, the Albanian blood that I have in me means so much to me. To be able to also represent Temecula and you know be part of this community and give back to the community now that I have the opportunity and the platform to do so is something that I look forward to continuing to do. So I want to thank once again everyone for inviting me here tonight. I hope you guys can all follow my journey as I move forward in Miss Universe, and I am very thankful for this award. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have one more certificate, and I'm gonna read this one, but this one is a surprise. So um, I'm not gonna say the name right, right off, but I'm gonna read it. The city of Temecula is proud to recognize blank for her ongoing dedication and service to our community. Blank relentlessly, here we go, pursued an opportunity to be part of the reality show Survivor. Uh -oh. mm -hmm. what is it? And when finally cast at 60 years of age, gave it everything she had. Although she was only on the live show for a week, she spent another month on set formulating a new plan. She knew her survivor experience was a platform to do greater good. Subsequently, Blank created the Reality <laughs> Rally fundraiser to bring fun, reality stars, and donations to a worthy cause in Temecula. Having lost a brother and both parents to cancer, she settled on Michelle's place to be the benefactor. Over the last decade, Blank has dedicated thousands of hours to this charity event. Miss Blank built strong relationships with countless community leaders, schools, and businesses throughout the region to support participation and donations to this event. The funds assist numerous patients and programs, including early detection and mammograms, snacks for support groups, school backpacks for children of Michelle's Place patients, and more. Ms. Blank created an event where all feel welcome and are encouraged to participate. Beyond this, she gives speeches to local schools and other groups to spread her message of achieving one's dreams. Ms. Blank provides hope, inspiration, and energy wherever she goes, including most recently on Temecula TEDx. Ms. Blank has a vision for the health and betterment of all humanity, and we thank her for using her platform to lift up our community. Miss Blank is Miss Jillian Larson. Come on down, Miss Jillian.
I am absolutely blown away, and I think I'm also blushing. Uh, <laughs> That's very, well, what a huge surprise. We got you here by deceptive you means. You did. Okay. <laughs> and we kept it a surprise. <laughs> um, you know, definitely um, we want to hear from you, but, you know, that one little certificate doesn't say enough. Your endless energy in putting on the reality <laughs> rally and what it has become every year is simply amazing. Jillian, you got anything you'd like to say? Well, thank you. First of all, I have to just continue to say I'm totally blown away. I mean, this was yes, it, I was it was I was coming anyway, but I, I said, yeah, I'll come. That's fine. Thank you, Kim. You were part of that plan, I understand. Um, but first of all, I want to thank all of you. Um, yes, I had this crazy dream, and by the way, I was 61 when I got on Survivor. Okay. One of two women over 60 that have ever made it. Um, so yeah, I'll just pat myself on the back for that yeah. one. Um, uh, so thank you guys. I mean, you have been so supportive. When I first approached Kim, I said, I've got this idea in my head that I formulated in the jungle of Gab Gabon in Africa, and I want to make some money for Michelle's place, but I also want to promote Temecula. And so I spoke to Chuck Washington, and he's a huge Survivor fan. I think he just wanted to beat Survivors. And he said, yeah, I think it'll work great. Uh, Kim's a huge fan of Survivor too. She says, yeah, that would be great. Plus she knew she didn't know the extent of what it would be. And actually, I wasn't sure either, because thank you, thank you, honorable mayor, city council members, city staff, and the whole of Temecula. Um, and beyond, we've included Murrieta, Menifee, Paris, Hemet, Corona, all of the surrounding towns in fun collaboration. But it's all about raising funds. And people say, you know, why? And I said, because I can, and I have the most amazing following that help. Every one of us is a volunteer. And yes, going in my advancing age, I will continue to do this, and uh, as long as I and we can, because I love what Michelle's Place does. Um, I'm so blessed that I don't have cancer, and I'm so blessed that we have some organization in town that opens their doors and their hearts to and that gives me goosebumps every time I say that that opens their doors and their hearts to help those that need it so yeah you certainly did blow me away today and yes I will continue to do this because we have over four or five hundred volunteers who come to help us every year. It's going to be May 14th, 15th, and 16th, and the mayor the will be something. there on stage right. welcoming the other something. cities. And we will continue to do it. And we, being four or 500 people, you are all part of that. And it's because we can, we care, and it is for Michelle's place and Temecula. So thank you. This is totally amazing. Uh, thank you from Miss Blank. I really appreciate <laughs> this. <laughs> thank you. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> so, so, I mean, we've all had a chance to participate in Reality Rally, and she makes it so much fun. Um, I would just point out the fact that the city of Temecula has recognized you, appreciates you, and loves you, and I don't think the city of Lake Elsinore has done anything. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. And I say that because Lake Elsinore beats us in the uh, city competition every year. Well, I must say that every time I go back um, to represent the trophy to them, they are always very appreciative and they of what they do and how they can come and beat everybody again, yeah. so watch yeah. out. Um, but they also are part of it because of Michelle's Place and they make that so clear. Because this isn't really me, this is for Michelle's Place in okay. Temecula, so I'll tell them though. <laughs> I'll tell them. Challenge on. Thank you guys, thank you everybody, Thanks, and thank you Temecula. <laughs> Um, I'm going to beg your indulgence tonight. I'm getting a migraine headache, and so um, I'm going to step off the dais and turn things over to the Mayor Pro Tem. I may be back, or I may not. We'll see how it mm. goes. But thanks, okay? Mayor Pro Tem, you got yeah. it. All right. All right. So we're up to public comments. Do we have any public comments? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, we do. We have nine public comments, and I believe we have a video. Perfect. Play the video, please. Good evening. I'm Lieutenant Novak with the Temecula Sheriff's Department. 
A total of 30 minutes is provided for members of the public to address the City Council on items that appear within the consent calendar or a matter not listed on the agenda. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. If the speaker chooses to address the City Council on an item listed on the consent calendar or a matter not listed on the agenda, a request to speak form may be filled out and filed with the City Clerk prior to the City Council addressing the public comments and the consent calendar. Once the speaker is called to speak, please come forward. For all public hearing or council business items on the agenda, a request to speak form may be filed with the city clerk prior to the city council addressing that item. On those items, each speaker is limited to five minutes. Very good. All right, let's have speaker number one. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, speaker number one is Bill Veal to be followed by Mercy Francis. Hey, Bill. Hello, Honorable uh, Mayor Pro Tem and the uh, city council. I'm Bill, otherwise known as Dead Eye from the <laughs> Gunfighters. Um, I have a short video. This is Dynamite, our leader. This video, by chance, is made by uh, none, other, none other than Jillian Larson. Anyway, this is uh, the Temecula Valley Historical Society. The, the presentation, that's Gussie. She's doing some quilting with the kids. This is the Kansas Mercantile, and that's Shelly Peters the proprietor. This is a bucket, bucket brigade run with uh, real water pumps and the people were learning how to do Morse code on a telegraph. This is a working telegraph and a lot of the people actually sent messages. We had a train, there's Daryl driving the train and we had skits by the Code of the West, Guns and Garters, the Old Town Tobacco Gunfighters, and Spurs and Satin. These included gun safety. By the way, it doesn't look like it, but it was 106 that day, I believe, or both days, actually, September 14th and 15th. And we had a good turnout regardless of that. That was a Gatling gun, and these are actually Civil War encampments. This, this is a, an 1860s schoolroom with a teacher and it was very popular with the uh, visiting children. The community uh, loved this and asked if we were going to do it again. And of course we say, yes, we're going to try. This is encouraging history and uh, the, uh, we had a lot of requests for special favors. There's another Civil War encampment. This is Captain, Captain Logan on the Union side. And I believe I see a Confederate soldier up there with him. This is the the blacksmith boys, they do singing and they do blacksmithing. That's the old town to make the gunfighters. And from the uh, 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 museum, that's uh, Daryl and Rebecca Farnbach in their stagecoach. Thank you very much. We would like to, like I said, we would like to do this again next year. It was a success regardless of the weather. We heard a lot of people said they wanted to go down but they said uh, over 100 degrees is too much for them. So they said, eh. we're, we're thinking about changing the date next year to maybe October and maybe hopefully get a little bit cooler. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mercy Francis to be followed by Kismayu Mohammed. Hi, Mercy. Good evening. Um, good evening, council members, city staff. My name is Mercy Francis, and this is my um, coworker, Ruth Gray. We're here to actually tell you about uh, job opportunities for our city of Temecula. Um, it's written in the Constitution in 1790 that uh, we do a good count every 10 years of, uh, of the population, the race, the sex, and so forth. But with this note, we want to get all a good data for to get funding for our federal uh, funding um, departments, also like for our roads, um, scholarships, schools, and so forth. 
Um, so the job pays well. It pays above minimum wage, which is starting at seven, $15.50 to like uh, eighteen fifty, And it's um, federal, again, and it's flexible um, hours. So um, we'd like for, uh, it's just ironic for the class of 2020 that um, this ha is going to happen. And also uh, the, minimum the minimum age is 18 and um, up to, um, we're not no bias. And also, so we're asking for you guys to spread the word to apply online, 2020census.gov forward slash jobs. Do you have any questions for us about the census? You know how important it is, how much money the community gets from the census. In fact, I've heard people say it's more important to fill out your census form than it is to vote as far as direct impact for your family. Um, so it's a good cause. It brings money to our community. And if any of you out there want a job this summer or this spring, um, talk to us after um, the meeting. And uh, most of the jobs pay $17 an hour, like Mercy said. Uh, but we're just trying to get the word out there. So if you know people that need work or are interested in extra money and, or um, serving the community, let us know. And so we're here. what's the time commitment? Um, you can fill out on the application how many hours you're available. Okay. Up to 40 hours. I always tell people to um, err on the side of more hours because you can always say no to jobs, but you may want more, more work this summer or um, when the jobs become available. Okay, cool. And you have to be 18, right? You have right. to be 18. Yes, I, from what I understand, you can apply when you're 17, but you won't be hired until you're 18. Got but it. there's retirees. We work with a couple of men who are in their 80s, and they love their jobs, and it's a weekly pay. Um, they also, there's just a lot of benefits. You know, they reimburse for mileage, and um, it's a good situation. All right, That's well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. The next speaker is Kismayu Mohammed to be followed by Lynette Savar. Oh, Ishmael. Okay. So Lynette Savar to be followed by Lewis Williams. Good evening, Lynette. How are you? I'm good. Well, it's an honor to be here to speak with you. My name is Lynette Savar, and I'm with Hospice of the Valleys. Um, Hospice of the Valleys, for over 35 years, we're a nonprofit agency and we take care of this community. Um, we take care of Southwest Riverside County and Fallbrook. Our employees and volunteers are united in a mission to provide the best end of life care for our community. The City of Temecula has provided support through the CDBG program and the City's Community Service Funding Program um, over the years. And I want to thank you for that. The impact that those dollars have is significant. The population that we care for is primarily seniors. That's probably, I'd say about 98% of our hospice care. And probably the other smaller percent is gonna be um, people that are unfortunately younger. Um, but some of the ways that your funding has helped us is this last year we've started a butterfly release for our families our bereaved families and their loved ones, and it's also open to the community. And we also have a luminary um, event in November this month that's also open to the community, and both events are held right here in Temecula. Um, and it's free of charge. And some of the people attending didn't have an opportunity to have a memorial for their loved one and use this time to have friends and family join them to honor the memory of their loved one. Um, in fact, we had one um, woman who lost her husband. They didn't have time for a memorial. She flew her son out from Texas, and they had neighbors come and participate in making a luminary in honor of her husband. Um, our bereavement support group we've had in Temecula for many years, and we offer free after-hours medication delivery so our families don't have to go out in the middle of the night to get medications. Um, we provide that for them. Um, in addition, the hospice hearts that we offer to our families, and it's something that we've been able to add um, over the past couple of years, and it's due to support from the city of Temecula and others that help us. And I wanted to just show this. Um, this heart is something that we only give to our bereaved families. 
And I don't know if you can see, there's a small heart in the middle mm -hmm. surrounded by a larger heart. And through this funding, it helps um, our bereaved families. Oh. Um, and it helps our bereaved families. It gives them a, a memento of the person they loved. And I wanted to share um, a note from one of our nurses um, that's with a, a lot you of our families. You have about five seconds. Five seconds. <laughs> and I think the biggest thing that she said is the heart signifies a profound loss of a loved one and reminds them that they will always be in their heart mm. and it's something for them to keep. Mm -hmm. And so, but I want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts at Hospice of the Valleys. All right, thank you very much. All right. The next speaker is Louis Williams to be followed by Kim Garish. Mr. Lou, how are you? City Council persons, thank you for having me. I, I come here today as a concerned parent because I have a daughter who currently attends Temecula Valley High School. She's a senior, and she happens to be parking at the sports park. Uh, one of the reasons she does that, besides just wanting to not have to deal with the crazy crowd, as she calls it, of parents dropping off their children. Any of you have experienced that with your children <laughs> know exactly what she was speaking of. The issue it, it, that I'm speaking about, though, from my understanding, I, I haven't read it formally secondhand, is that there was a proposal, or maybe even it had been passed, an ordinance, or whatever you might call it, where we've changed the hours, basically targeting those kids to make it impossible them, for them to park there before school. And talking to the principal of the school, and in talking to the registrar, and then talking to the, uh, um, the actual secretary who collects the money for parking, they don't have any more parking in the school. Now, I went by this morning and counted 84 cars there at 9 a.m., two or three people I could see walking in the park. So quite a few kids are using that, and my understanding is that they've been using that as an overflow parking area for quite a while. You know, Temecula Valley High School was one of the first high schools, or maybe the first in Temecula, and I don't think they anticipated the growth. The registrar told me today that they opened in the 80s with 1,000 kids. She said as of today, they have 3,085 students there. And she said they grew 300 just last year. So the school has, you know, has outgrown, or the community's outgrown the school and the parking situation. And so with no place to park, these kids that are parking in those spots who typically take people, those 84 cars don't represent just 84 kids, but maybe double that amount. Um, it creates quite a hardship for parents to have to go into the community or the kids to have to find another parking spot, so to speak. You know, they can park across the street, but there is no, if you've been to that school, there is no crosswalk right there. So the kids jaywalk, and if you've ever dropped off your kids there, you see it's like a game of chicken as the kids run across the street against traffic, as illegal as it may be. And so... I'm just concerned that this, although it may have had good intentions of getting away with some prime or other issue, I'm sure, what you might be doing is putting our students in danger, you know, with, with, with a situation that would be created by the lack of parking. And talking to the principal and the registrar, they both said they were aware of the parking issue, but it doesn't sound like city council worked with the school directly to give them enough time to reconfigure the parking lots or whatever they could try to do to put more parking on campus. And if this goes into effect, to my understanding, within a week or so and the kids start to be ticketed, it'll create quite a financial hardship. The distance they would have to walk further is approximately 700 yards. You know, it's not a lot. It, you know, it may not sound like a lot, but the kid's average backpack is about 30 pounds. Do that in the rain or when it's 100 degrees on top of the walk. And, and so from where you would propose they park now, if they continue to use a sports park, it would be about a three-quarters of a mile walk from that into the school to start class. So those are the issues that I bring before you. I don't know if those were considered when you made this, this particular decision to get rid of the parking lot. I'm even told that Great Oak uses the sports park across the street for their overflow parking lot. It's pretty common practice. So targeting the kids at this particular school um, and, you know, and basically displacing them from their parking, I'm not sure that's the role of city council. Right. I know that it's not sitting well with my patients when I discuss it with them, that's for sure. You're out of time, but we are going to do a staff report and answer probably a lot of your questions. So, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Right. Thank you. The next speaker... Ms. Kim. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. I just want to say thank you so much uh, for your support of Michelle's Place programs and services and your consideration of the CS funding this evening. Uh, as you know, with our expansion into all cancers, we have a much bigger need. We have helped 2,023 people already to date this year. Last year, all of last year was 1,800. 
So wow. you can see the need is even greater and will continue to grow. So thank you so much for your ongoing support, not just this evening, but always in what we do. And I may or may not have asked Jillian to be here under false pretenses. <laughs> Miss Blank showed up. Um, and we're so grateful. And so I want to take this opportunity to, to thank you, Jillian, <laughs> for all that she does for Michelle's place. As you guys know, she is just a voice bigger than any one of us can be. And so I, um, I truly appreciate her support and all that she does for Michelle's place because Without her, uh, you know, I scared her a little bit this year, and I said, you know, you're in our budget, so you got to kind of have to keep doing it. So thank you for recognizing her this evening, because she deserves it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So th the next speaker was Jillian, but Jillian didn't know about the initial surprise. So Jillian, did you still have something else to say? All right. Then our final speaker is Ginger Greaves. Hello, I'm Ginger Greaves, Executive Director with the Santa Rosa Plateau Nature Education Foundation. And we're um, out in the community now on behalf of the Plateau Management Committee, which is represented by Metropolitan Water District, the Nature Conservancy, Riverside County Regional Parks and Open Space District, and California Fish and Wildlife. The foundation has been designated as a spokes persons or organization and also the official fundraiser uh, to help restore and reopen the Santa Rosa Plateau. But we are visiting our city councils and our different organizations that are very supportive of our work to give you an update on what is happening with the fire and as our way of thanking you also for your continued support. We've had an enormous amount of, of community um, outreach in regards to the fire. Uh, the reserve does remain closed at this time. 2,000 acres were burned. I don't know if everyone is aware of that. Uh, we gave a shout out to Cal Fire that took a stand and saved the visitor center. Uh, the fire came right up to the visitor center. In fact, it was miraculous that it was saved. Uh, the assets that were destroyed are, are severely damaged, also affecting the security and the safety of the property. That's why the visitor center is continuing to be closed. We're asking for public pay uh, as the biologists and land managers make their decisions on how to reopen the property so that it is safe and secure. A major fundraising campaign is being launched. There is a GoFundMe page. Also, GoFundMe at SRPF, uh, GoFundMe SRPF Fire Fund as well, but more than the raising of the funds to help restore the property is an awareness to the community of how we have received the outreach and an understanding from them about this property and the importance that it has played in a lot of people's lives, in their families' lives, in the education programs that are provided as well. So we're just taking this opportunity to Thank our communities for the outreach, give them aware of what's happening, look for a potential reopening. I'm not a, at liberty to give a date or a time frame. We do need two, we need at least two good rains, so pray for rain, uh, so that uh, the, um, uh, the foliage and so the habitats can be restored. Uh, but uh, we're, we are hoping with uh, continued community outreach and support that uh, after the new year, the property will be reopened. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Any more speakers? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, that concludes our public comments on non-agendized items. We do have four speakers on consent item number five, which I understand you will be pulling for a staff report, Correct. and we can hear from them at that time. Okay, perfect. Um, council reports, do we have any? <coughs> Mr. Zach. Yeah, I'm, uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I have a couple of quick announcements. I got a slide I'd like to throw up. So. Uh, as our PS Drive Safe campaign sort of came to an end, one thing we wanted to add to that was a, a, a little bit of an education component. And while we don't control the, the laws in California as they relate to DUIs, we certainly can do what, our, our part locally. And this was one of those things that we wanted to do. So this is a first of a kind for our area. Uh, thank you to the, Temer, uh, the, the Temecula Sheriff's Station for going out into the community. And what they did is they went out into a bar 
and they talked with uh, people, patrons that were out and about, and did they know what their blood alcohol level was when they were drinking? So they were able to sort of um, try to understand what alcohol does to their body. Uh, this was very successful uh, from what I hear. We'd like to do it a couple more times in the community. Um, it's just one of those things where, that we can do. We can make a good touch in the community. Uh, the sheriffs did a great job when they were out there. And the more we understand as a, as a community the impacts we have when we drink and drive, the better we'll all be. So this was one thing we really wanted to highlight. And on a slightly happier note, we will be opening uh, the much anticipated pump track over at Ronald Reagan Sports Park, Tuesday, November 19th, 4 p.m. Everyone is invited. Uh, this is going to be an exciting event. Uh, these pictures are from a couple weeks ago. The, the, the pump track is, uh, is nearly complete, and um, everyone is extremely excited about it, uh, as, as I am. I know some folks are, uh, are itching to get on the pump track, so come join us that evening. We'll cut the ribbon. Uh, I have a bike, so anyone on uh, city council that would like to ride, you're more than welcome to ride. Um, is that the e-bike? It is not an e-bike, oh. you, but you don't have to pedal on the pump track, so yeah. it's all about momentum and, and pumping through. I so. guarantee you my feet would not reach the pedals. Right. If they do, would you like to ride? No. Oh, darn it. <laughs> I thought I'd catch you one there. Uh, come out and enjoy this new amenity to Ronald Reagan Sports Park. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. All right, well, I do have one, and I think I have a slide on this, too, about the Veterans Day concert last night. If there's a slide, okay. I don't know if any of you were there, but it was an amazing concert. Mm -hmm. The Temecula Symph Symphony put it on, and I was just sitting there, and I actually made a comment to a couple people around me that it felt like we lived in small town USA 50 years ago. I mean, it was just a cool thing that you, you know, you just envisioned the bandstand from, you know, in the 50s. And it was just a great concert. Uh, very well attended, and it was a, a very good uh, way to end Veterans Day. So thank you all for who participated and set it up. So thank you. All right, so now we're going to move on to our consent calendar. And as I said, uh, we are going to pull item number five. Um, all matters listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine, and all will be enacted uh, by one roll call vote. There will be no discussion of these items unless a member of the City Council requests specific items to re be removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Number one, waive reading of standard ordinance and resolution. Number two, approve action minutes of October 22nd, 2019. Number three, approve the list of demands. Number four, approve City Treasurer's Report of September 30th, 2019. Number five, adopt an ordinance 19-15, amending city park hours, second reading. Number six, approve amended salary schedules to reflect administrative adjustments to the city's classification system and comply with state minimum wage mandates. Number seven, initiate proceedings to renew the Visit Temecula Valley Tourism Business Improvement District under the Property and Business Improvement District Law of 1994. Um, number eight, approve the Community Services Community Service Funding Program for fiscal year 2019-20. Uh, number nine, approve First Amendment to First Amendment to the agreement with Questica. LTD for budgeting software mm -hmm. system. Number 10, approve Microsoft Enterprise Renewal Agreement with CDW-G for Microsoft Software License. Number 11, approve agreement with FEAR and Peers for updated CEQA traffic thresholds and guidelines. Number 12, Approve non-exclusive commodity agreement with Musco Sports Lighting LLC for purchase of multi-use field lighting equipment at Paloma del Sol Park. Number 13, approve the first agreement, a first amendment to the agreement for consultant services with 
Michael Baker International Inc. for traffic, signal, park and ride, assess, uh, access improvement, PW 18-11. Number 14, accept, imp accept improvements and file notice of completion for pavement rehabilitation citywide Meadowview Loop PW 18-10. Number, <coughs> number 15, receive and file temporary closures for 2019 Winterfest events. And that's it. And I will be abstaining from number 14 um, since I live in Meadowview. So are there... Move approval. All right. Polling Second. number five. Okay. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Please vote. All right, that passes 4-0 with um, our mayor missing. Um, but can we have a staff report on item number five? Absolutely, Mr. Uh, mayor of Pro Tem. Typically with the second reading, you don't get many requests for an additional staff report, but staff is appreciative of the opportunity to once again clarify directly and accurately um, for the community the intent of the proposed ordinance. As such, I'll ask Community Services Superintendent Erica Russo for a brief overview. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Good evening, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council. As you know, before you this evening, we have a presentation regarding this item, which one of the members of the audience already discussed. Here we go. Before you for a second reading is an ordinance amending section of the Temecula Municipal Code number 12.04.190. This amendment will standardize city park hours. As you may recall, at the last meeting, we had a resolution revising designated parking hours in city parking lots, which was approved. For a bit of background behind this item, the reason why it's before you this evening is in response to a number of incidents we've had at our city facilities and parks. These include drug and alcohol possession and use, excessive vandalism, graffiti, and litter, overnight parking, informal camping, and sleeping in vehicles, and fighting assault and harassment of staff and patrons. As you may be aware, these comments have not come just from staff, but from the public as well. As many of you, I'm sure, are personally aware, you've received these comments in social media as well as in direct contact with council members. Additionally, we get these comments through our city app, by which residents can report any concerns they have, as well as through feedback from our community services master plan process, which has included substantial amounts of public outreach. Additionally, these concerns have been corroborated by law enforcement, our contract security firm, and our park rangers. Now, in general, there are two specific areas of concern. The first is overnight parking, which we see at many of our facilities and parks. And in general, the attendant problems associated with overnight parking include vandalism and littering, drug and alcohol use, and urination and defecation. Our second area of concern is Ronald Reagan Sports Park, specifically the northeastern portion of the parking lot after school hours. In this area, we've seen a significant uptick over the last two years in fighting vandalism and drug and alcohol use. And given some of the concerns that have been expressed by parents concerning the impact of families parking in this area, I do want to mention that some of the vandalism we've seen has included damages to our restrooms, uh, the lighting fixtures there, and Memorial Grove, which is the area where we have some trees that were planted in memory mm -hmm. of various people in the community, as well as park benches. We've had monuments that have been um, dedicated to members of the military that have been defaced, trees that have been cut down, and benches that have been vandalized. So just to clarify the area we're talking about, if you look at this area in map, you'll see TVHS on the right, the lower left, the sports fields, and that intersection, of course, is Margarita and Rancho Vista. The area in red is the area we're talking about. This area, as uh, Mr. Williams mentioned earlier, has become de facto overflow parking for the high school over the last several years. It creates a situation with congregation after school, and he mentioned that he counted 84 cars there, and that, that, that tracks with what we see. Typically after school, we see upwards of about 200 kids uh, congregating in that area. And that area is a parking lot. It was never designed to have that volume. We love having people in our parks, and we certainly love having kids enjoying our parks after school. But that area of the parking lot was never designed for that purpose. It's not clear from this aerial photo, but that area is actually below grade of the adjacent streets. 
So if you're on Margarita or you're on Rancho Vista, you're above the level of parking. That creates line of sight problems. So there's a lot of visibility issues there and it's hard to really see what's going on. We had an issue just last week where one of our park rangers, because we have dedicated our park rangers to increasing patrols in this area in an attempt to be proactive and forestall some of these incidents, uh, actually had her park ranger vehicle surrounded by a handful of students who were yelling at her and we have video of that. We've also had uh, multiple fights and we've had to ban some people from being able to use the facilities altogether due to these problems. Taken in total, these incidents, not just at Ronald Reagan Sports Park, but including the overnight parking we're seeing at many of our other facilities, jeopardize the safety of city staff, patrons, and students, and they're very costly to address. We've seen a distinct uptick in costs associated with calls for service to law enforcement, increased need for contract security. We now retain a contract security firm that we use to patrol our facilities and parking lots, and we try to sort of allocate that resource as best we can as well as increased costs of maintaining the buildings, the landscape, and the fixtures. We've had a lot of expenses associated with not just remediating graffiti, but also the time you're spending sending individuals out there to work, staff costs, uh, replacing light fixtures, repairing mirrors in the bathroom, replacing trees that have been cut down in Memorial Grove, and restoring park benches and other monuments there. Um, additionally, there are labor costs associated with the staff in the facilities who are now dedicating an increasing portion of their time to trying to intervene and sort of mediate some of these issues. And finally, in a few cases, we have had costs associated with legal action where we have had to pursue cease and desist or other restraining orders against certain individuals who have committed the most egregious acts in our facilities. Now, I will pause for a moment to say we understand this ordinance amendment is not going to solve all of these problems. This is our best attempt at trying to address some of them in a proactive fashion. In total, these incidents negatively affect the safe use and enjoyment of our facilities by the public. So uh, the Parks and Recreation and Community Services Subcommittee, of which Mayor Pro Tem Stewart and Councilmember Schwank are members, directed staff to draft some recommendations that could help alleviate some of these issues and bring them forward. Following discussions with law enforcement, school administration, facility staff, and the city attorney's office, we bring forward the two items that you saw before you last meeting, which one of which the ordinance is here again for a second reading. Collectively, this ordinance and this resolution will prohibit overnight parking at all facilities and parks, and it will change park operational hours to improve enforceability and decrease unwanted activities. Now, to clarify, um, currently our passive parks are closed dusk to dawn, and our community, or we call them sports parks, the ones with lights, are closed from 11 p.m. to dawn. That dusk to dawn is a little bit subjective and it creates some enforcement issues. So one of the things we've done with this is we recommend the um, actual hours for closing. And because they were dusk to dawn, we erred on the conservative side of preserving people's access to the parks and facilities when we recommended these hours, which are for our passive parks to be closed from 9 p.m. until 5 a.m., which is for most of the year well after dusk and before dawn, and for our sports parks to be closed from 10 p.m. until 5 a.m. Now there are a few exceptions, if you'll bear with me. The aquatics area at the CRC is going to open a little bit earlier because we have early morning swim programs. The northeast corner of Ronald Reagan Sports Park, which we saw in that earlier slide, would have more restricted hours for parking in the morning. And Red Hawk Community Park would open later at 8 a.m. because it is gated and we need to have staff go and open the gate. At all other facilities, there would be no parking outside hours of operation for the facilities. So for example, the Temecula Community Center on Pujol Street is a rental. When it's open, the parking lot is open. When the facility is closed, there's no parking there. In all cases, signage will post the operating hours. So although this seems complex, the community doesn't need to worry about what the hours are. They can go see the signs and it will be clear where parking is permitted. Now, to revisit the area of specific concern at the CRC, again, if we look at this aerial map, the area in blue is the aquatics area of the CRC. In that area, we're opening early at 4 a.m. because we do have some very early, very enthusiastic swimmers, and we want them to be able to park there to utilize the facility. The orange area represents the CRC and the sports park, that stretch that follows along the contour of the sports fields. That area will open at 5 a.m., which is the standard opening hour for all of our sports parks. It's the two areas in yellow, which represent that very northeastern corner, which is very much below grade, and then that smaller area, which is around the uh, skate park, which is also sort of closed off a little bit by some mature trees. It also has some line of sight issues. Those two issues, would, those two areas, I'm sorry, would be the areas that would be closed for parking from 10 p.m. until 8 a.m. Monday through Friday. On Saturday and Sunday, they would have normal hours. Now, as always, our goal is to maximize public safety while minimizing impact to our residents. So we do hear and understand the concerns that we've heard, not just this evening from Mr. Williams, but the emails we've received and the phone calls we've received 
from other parents and families who've become a, accustomed to using this as their de facto overflow parking for the high school. To keep in mind, these changes will provide law enforcement, our park rangers, and our contract security with objective parameters they can enforce by changing it from dusk to dawn to hours, much easier to enforce. Additionally, as we've mentioned, the parking restrictions will be designated with signage, and the park rangers will be trained to act as ambassadors. Now, we've heard some concerns from people about that we're going to be out there ticketing. This is never meant to be a punitive measure. This is not in any way meant we're not going to be having people out there just waiting to issue tickets this is not intended to be punitive to anyone, nor is it intended to be a revenue generator. This is simply intended to provide an enforceable parameter governing when these areas can be used. Finally, the rollout will be coordinated with TVHS to minimize the impact. Now, we have worked very closely with the TVHS administration and the school resource officer yeah. in developing these guidelines. It's part of why it's taken us so long to roll these out, because we originally met with the subcommittee uh, back in January, I believe. And our intention was to have something to roll out over the summer so it would coincide with the new school year. But it took a lot of time to go back and forth and really try and massage this and develop something workable. We have worked very closely with TVHS on this. Um, and we were provided with some information from them specifically stating that um, their ultimate goal is to always have all student drivers park on the campuses. And they are confident that they will be able to accommodate the current TVHS junior and senior drivers in accordance with TVHS practice. To assist with the supervision costs on campus, there is a fee associated with parking. Their intent is to prorate that parking fee for the remainder of the school year. Our intent is to roll this out over the Christmas break, so it will be in place for the second semester. They're estimating that that prorated parking permit will be $27 for the remainder of the school year. Um, finally, the school encourages families and students to reach out directly to the TVHS administration regarding any inquiries and options to meet their parking needs moving forward. In conclusion, we just want to emphasize that these, these items are not being brought forward in isolation. Rather, they are part of a comprehensive approach, which is consistent with the city's general proactive approach to public safety. Some other issues which have been brought forward in the past, um, several years ago, council approved restricting overnight parking at Mary Phillips Senior Center and the Temecula Valley Museum in response to some issues we were having there. We have a CIP implementing citywide security cameras at our facilities. We've increased our contract security presence. We've recently installed gates on the theater courtyard in response to some public safety concerns we had there, which again is kind of an enclosed uh, area. Um, we monitor and take proactive measures regarding public restroom access in response to complaints regarding that. And of course, as you're well aware, Measure S allocations have been made to additional public safety resources, including one additional park ranger bringing our total up to three. So again, just to emphasize that none of these uh, initiatives were to be brought forward in any way to be punitive, nor were they brought forward in any way to cause problems for families, but rather to be part of a comprehensive and proactive approach to enhancing public safety and maximizing the enjoyment of the wonderful public amenities that we enjoy here in the city. That concludes my presentation. We're available for any questions. I do have a question. So um, if we're going to, it, do we have a way to actually close those parking lots off? Mm -hmm. I mean, is there going to be any like chains or how, how will people not be able to park there? That's what I'm. Well, at this point, all those areas will be signed, and it would just be like any other restricted parking area where if you're parking outside of the permitted times, it's a citable offense. But no, there's no plan at this point to gate all of the parking lots. So, and I, I'm assuming we're using those two parking areas is because line of sight is, mm -hmm. is poor. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, it, Well, specifically, line of sight is poor there, and because this has been a hot spot of where we've had incidents in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Matt? Yeah, so what's the, what's the limitation, or are we aware of, of limitation for parking on campus? Uh, the TVHS administration has informed us that they have adequate parking for all current juniors and seniors. For all current juniors and seniors. Oh, hang on, you'll get your chance. We don't do outbursts in City Hall. Um, so do we, can we verify that they have enough parking spots for all not just juniors and seniors, but anybody who is driving to campus, do they have enough parking spots? Uh, the statement that was provided to us today by the district was, we want to assure our school community that we are working on a plan and are confident that we will be able to accommodate the current TVHS junior and senior drivers in accordance with TVHS practice. They also state that they are in support of this measure. Okay, so they didn't answer the question then. Well, in fairness, no. we didn't ask them. Right, okay. Um, what's, the, what's the parking? fee cost to park on your school? They're property. saying the prorated amount for the second semester would be $27, which leads me to believe for the entire year it would be approximately 54, but I don't know that. $54 a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. 
Any other questions? I do not have any questions. Mm -mm. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so let's open it up to We have, Mr. Comment. Mayor Pro Tem, we have four speakers. The first speaker is Clara Reagan, to be followed by Savannah Lormar. All right, okay. Okay, um, hold on one second. We don't do clapping. I mean, if you want to acknowledge, you know, you agree, maybe wave your hands like this, but no outbursts. And you know, wait your turn if you're if you're in line to speak. Just wait for your three minutes. So thank you. Hello, um, I am actually a senior at TBHS right now, and I have been parking on the sports park for three years. I do understand that there are some students that do cause problems, but you would be displacing a lot of students, especially in the middle of the school year. We would not have enough time over spring break. Also, I do believe it's somewhat illegal to park across the street into the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. It is illegal to park there. Yeah. And also, you cannot park at the church up there. You cannot park at the apartments up there. Also, if you park at Hilberto's, you also get ticketed. I do also believe we did talk with Cheryl, who is a supervisor. She told us that there's less than 25 spots available. For the seniors, that's 20 spots. And for the juniors, that's five spots. That's not allowing, you guys said about 65. It's not allowing for 65 students to be displaced. And honestly, I just if you guys would have started at the beginning of the year, that would have given us a little bit more time to adjust. But starting at halfway through the next semester is going to be very difficult. And I just want to say, we, we can be in support, but you just got to give us a little bit more time to adjust. I'm not with you. I'm not against you. But I am saying, give us some time. Thank you for your time. The next speaker is Savannah Lorimar to be followed by Melissa Diaz. Um, good evening, city uh, council members and citizens of Temecula. Uh, my name is Savannah Laramore, and I'm speaking you to, to you tonight because I believe that the Ronald Reagan Sports Park should not be closed um, for parking for students who go to Temecula Valley High School. Um, closing the park means that all the new drivers have no other choice but to park on Margarita Road, which is already very busy um, before and after school. Uh, most of the new drivers are not yet confident to parallel park. Uh, 16, 17, and 18 year olds parallel parking while a school zone is clogged up with traffic may very well result in an increase in um, car accidents. Uh, since the ordinance has already been passed, uh, I would like to propose a moratorium on the implementation of the law until the end of the school year so that the community, parents, students, and all stakeholders can have a reasonable amount of time to make arrangements. Uh, for many students at Temecula Valley High School, driving themselves to school is their only option. So parking spot and Sorry, parking spots provided by the school are often too expensive and um, are very limited. So Ronald Reagan's parking lot is their only alternative. Uh, to end, students and parents at least need time to prepare for the six minutes. Thank you. The next speaker is Melissa Diaz to be followed by Rena Johnson. your time. I'd like to start just by saying I'm the mother of a Temecula Valley graduate, a current senior and a current sophomore that drive to and park in Ronald Ray Sports Park. I was a resident of Temecula for many years. We have since moved to French Valley, but I was so impressed with the academics that are, were offered at Temecula Valley that I applied to have my children and they now drive, <clears throat> excuse me, they now drive 30 minutes to get there just so they can go to that school. Um, I would like to say that I'm a 911 police and fire dispatcher for the city of Escondido for 22 years. So I'm very familiar with the issues that are involved at city parks and with children and with schools and the various things that are associated with it. So I was, I've been in communication with both the vice principal and the principal uh, via email and via telephone. Last Thursday, the vice principal told me that they were aware of the resolution, 
However, they have no plan in place. The principal said, and quote, we are committed to finding spots for students who choose to purchase a spot at the school. Again, a very political answer, because when I tried to pin him down and say, what is your solution? He just said, we're going to try and make it happen. So you're penalizing the majority of law-abiding citizens that are parking students, that are parking there because of some students that are committing crimes. I don't know what the breakdown is on you know, vagrants or transients committing the crimes and the damage versus the students, but it's not fair for the kids that park there to be penalized because there are some students that are committing crimes. Seems like it's a more efficient use of police services to be over there issuing tickets for disturbing the peace, for drug use, for assault, if that's the case, as opposed to spending time going and clearing up parking lots. This morning, I drove by there specifically to count just what was in that corner that showed on the map. There were 101 cars parked there. Now, assuming that none of those children park and carpool, then you're talking 101 children that have nowhere to park. My son's friend went to get a parking permit last Thursday and was told there were two left. The principal says there's no spots available. The $27, although it can be you know, a detriment to some of the children that are parking there, if they have a problem with what's going on over at the park, then take the tens of thousands of dollars that they're getting from these parking spots charging $50 a year plus $30 to paint it if they want to make it pretty. Use some of that money, put it aside to pay for park rangers or extra SROs or citizen patrols or whatever you need, and maybe issue permits. Your time is up, sorry. Okay, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. The last speaker is Rena Johnson. Hello, good evening. Um, I am also a student at Temecula Valley High School and I wanted to obviously address this ordinance. Um, I really wanna bring up the concern of how you guys feel or whoever's proposing this ordinance feels that this will solve any of the problems that are being addressed. Um, I just, it's not very clear to me how moving a problem 50 feet to the left will have any effect on the levels of crime and the ability of those students parking 50 feet to the left to return to the exact same parking spot that is being, um, that is the level of concern at this moment. I just wanna know how that is meant to have any impact on the levels of crime and violence and drug activity that are being um, presented right now. Um, in my mind, the only realistic way for this to be solved is for a permanent officer to be stationed before and after school in this area to control and deal with these problems as they arise. I do not feel that this ordinance will have any positive impacts. In fact, what everyone else ha that has come up here to speak on this has said is true. It's not gonna solve any problems, it's only gonna create more. Like, students parallel parking on Margarita or Rancho, like, that's, <laughs> parallel parking isn't even on the driving test anymore. These kids have never parallel parked in their life. Like, they have no idea what they're doing. You're going to see accidents. You're going to see traffic jams. You're going to have angry and aggressive drivers out on these roads early in the morning and after school. This is not an effective way to solve these problems. And I urge you guys to please think this over very carefully and explore all other possible avenues before making this decision. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, that concludes all of the public comments we have. All right, well, thank you. Thank you for all the comments. Um, our council mates, what is your, any comments? Questions? Yeah, I, I like the point that was made about what good does it do to move, you know, move 50 feet away. And, and I think the issue here was, is it line of sight because of shrubbery, because of bushes, because of elevation? Below grade, yeah. Below grade? Yeah. And so by moving it the direction that, th that we're looking at, it, it, ra it, it raises up to street level. Is that right? And so that's the difference? OK. That's correct. I just want to check to see why. Just a couple follow-up questions. What, I mean, just sort of back of the envelope, um, does anybody have an idea of what the cost would be for either you know, SRO or private security to uh, be there before and after uh, school? 
Well, we do have an SRO there before and after school. Um, Captain McConnell, I know we have SRO Deputy Kennedy here who's assigned to Temecula Valley High School. And if it's the council's pleasure, we can take his testimony on, on how we got here. But, but generally speaking, he, I believe he, he is there during the day. Yeah. On, yeah. on school, on school district property. property. Well, that's what I'm saying. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, because we don't want to take away from that. It's important to have a safety officer on the campus, right? So I'm just curious what the additional cost would be if, if there were either private security or an SRO um, as an option. Do you have like a best guess? You know, um, I won't hold you to when, it. Well, a deputy... A dep I know what a deputy costs, right? It's about $350,000 a year to the mm -hmm. city of Temecula. So um, stationing a deputy there in that parking lot is not the highest and best use of their time, obviously. We're already supplementing sort of the surveillance of the parking lot, I think, with private security, which obviously comes at a lesser price tag. We're supplementing the eyes on the park with park rangers, which come at a lesser price cost um, and so you know I think we're we're currently exhausting a lot of those those human resources that we have available to us now so okay and the shifting of the parking spots to where you're locating it what's the uh, estimated maximum walking distance compared to where they're parking now again just best guess Erica or Mike, do you want to take a stab at that? Maybe we throw up that exhibit with the, um, mm -hmm. the aerial. Sure, if we can get the video. There we go. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a scale on that to be able to tell you. Uh, the speaker earlier estimated that it was an extra 500 yards. I, unfortunately, I can't verify that one way or the other. Speaking to the issue of what that will alleviate by shifting, two things. One, you can see that the parking in that area is aligned. It's parallel on either side. There's just two rows of parking. Mm -hmm. So it prevents this kind of ability for massive groups of people to just congregate. Whereas those areas over to the right in the northeast corner, it's a big open space, which is really um, kind of conducive to just sort of large groups of people congregating. The other thing is, as um, Councilmember Edwards asked, this area is closer to grade with the road, so there's much better lines of sight. And it's also closer to the other amenities we have there where we have staff. OK. Um, regarding the cost of the security, we currently pay $25 an hour approximately for our contract security, varying according to how many hours we're contracting them for. Do we have security there uh, before and after school? Uh, no, not regularly. Currently, we contract with a private security firm that we use to rotate among our different facilities because we also have a lot of demand at the library um, and at many of our other facilities as well. Additionally, our park rangers, we have three rangers, and they have to rotate between facilities as well. So we've not been able to dedicate the resources to put a body there to monitor every single day. And again, these incidents, we understand this isn't a panacea. Those incidents aren't happening every single day, but when they do happen, they are serious. Hmm. All right, Marianne. Mr. So, Mayor Pro Tem, if I yeah. could, just we measured sort of the distance on the GIS from the driveway there on um, Rancho Vista to the corner there, at Margarita, and it looks like it's about seven seven fifty seven hundred fifty feet. Feet. So approximately two football fields. Yeah. Yeah, 300 feet per football field. Right, yeah. So, so two and a half. Okay. Okay. Are, are, we, are we considering, are we looking at this from a safety standpoint for the student's sake, certainly probably, um, if we have people loitering there in the morning or, you know, transients or something like that? Um, have the issues been with students or have the issues been with other people, older people, um, adults, or drug sales, or, you know, do we know? Uh, the issues that happen overnight, we can't always verify who's committing them, but there have been a number of issues in those after-school hours that we absolutely know were from certain students. Okay. We've had multiple incidents on video as well. 
So then I guess the follow-up question is, if we're, we're doing video surveillance now, and so we can clearly identify faces, what, are, what options do we have if we see something taking place? Obviously, if there's fighting going on, I don't know that there's anything we can do other than to be on scene right then and break it up. But, but if, certainly if there's vandalism or drug sales or anything like that, or assaults or anything, um, when we've been able to identify individuals, we have taken legal recourse. Specifically, we have issued bans for several individuals who've been identified in uh, some particular fights that took place uh, last semester. Um, we've also issued, we've pursued a couple of workplace violence restraining orders, uh, not specifically for the Ronald Reagan area, but when we've had staff members who were threatened by individuals in the parks. Okay. And it's true. I, I recall several incidents in the last, you know, 18 months where we've had our park rangers actually breaking up altercations in this property so they it has spilled over into staff sort of doing their best to intervene and, and break up altercations on that parking lot. Mm -hmm. So how many incidents have we had so far this year? Offhand, I don't have a number on that. There are a number okay. of incidents we don't have um, documentation that we hear about the next day. Mm -hmm. I would say offhand this school year, I can think of at least 10 altercations that I'm aware of, some of them involving staff, some just involving students. Um, in some cases, we were made aware of them after the fact by seeing videos go on social media, and we didn't necessarily have staff there to observe them. Hmm. In addition, we've had substantial numbers of um, maintenance issues resulting from, we've had uh, lights there that were shot out. Uh, we've had multiple incidents of vandalism in the bathrooms at both North South and Ronald Reagan. And we've had multiple incidents of vandalism, probably a half dozen incidents of vandalism at the Memorial Grove. But are we, but we're assuming, we're not assuming that that didn't happen at night? I mean, well. In some cases, we know it happened at night when the uh, maintenance crew comes out the next morning and there it is and it wasn't there the day before. And right. other times we've seen it happen or other people have witnessed it happen and have reported to, to us happening after school hours. Do we have surveillance at that park? Not yet. Yeah, but that's one of the parks we Ronald are. Ronald Reagan is one of the planned sports parks to eventually add surveillance. Well, I personally would be more um, comfortable if we, at minimum, rolled this out after this fiscal school year. I mean, just because just what she was talking about, it would take time for families to make other arrangements and I don't know. I that that's my personal opinion, but Matt. Well, hang on a second because I also heard uh, earlier that we just very recently had a staff member surrounded by a group of folks. That's could, could you describe that for us? Mm -hmm. Yes, that was this past week. Actually, Deputy Kennedy shared the video footage with me. It was our park ranger, our newest park ranger, who was in her vehicle and was surrounded by several students who were verbally assaulting her through the windows. And my understanding is it was because she had asked them to desist in some behavior. So, so I would say no. Okay. Um, because, you know, look, our, our staff cannot be put in a position where their safety is at risk. Mm -hmm. The students out there, I get it, right? You all came here, hopefully you are all the A-plus students, or at least, you know, close to it. I, I wasn't, so I'll be honest. <laughs> Um, so, you know, but you're hopefully not the ones that are starting fights and doing, you know, the, uh, the, being the bad actor, if you will, in our parking lots, uh, uh, in the parks, right? You're here because you, you have a need for parking and you're, you're feeling as though, I'm going to characterize this as best I can, as though you're being dis disenfranchised in a way because you've done nothing wrong. And yet mm -hmm. it's this, you know, handful of folks who are impacting you in a very negative way in your ability to have parking. I get that 100%. You also have to recognize, though, I think there are lots of laws that are created on the books because of that small group of bad actors that are out there who make it very difficult for us to lead, you know, a normal life like we would like to because we would never contemplate surrounding a park ranger and, you know, verbally assaulting them in their vehicle, right? That's just not something that would ever occur to us. So my default is always going to be to, you know, make sure that we create an environment that's safe for the students. Because if, if they're bold enough to do that to a park ranger and an adult and a staff member, I can only contemplate what has happened with the fights that occur in those parking lots with other students, right? So 
you know, it's incumbent on us to create the safe environment. And if we're not able to achieve that, how we currently are, and, and especially with staff that don't have the enforcement authority that law enforcement do, mm -hmm. um, we cannot be placing our staff in a position where, where they are at risk. Um, and, you know, following that line of thought, if our folks or if you know, you know, the, these uh, security, private security companies, do they have any enforcement authority at all? Or are they just more like, you know, observe and report type? Yeah. Yes, they're more observe and yeah. report. Okay. Because the reason I bring that up is just sort of back of the envelope. If we were to place, you know, an SRO or, or, or a deputy on that site, back of the envelope calculation here, school year roughly costs somewhere between, for the number of hours they're going to be on site in that parking area, somewhere between twenty-five dollars and $35,000 annually, right? Private security, I'm estimating to be somewhere below $10,000 annually, right? Either way, my biggest issue with all of this is that this 100% is the school's and the school district's responsibility. Mm -hmm. The city of Temecula is not here to subsidize the school district or the school's lack of accountability and responsibility for providing a safe environment for its students. You know, if they're willing to come up with twenty-five dollars to $35,000 a year for us to place a deputy in that parking lot, by all means, let's do it, right? And if you guys are paying parking fees to park on school property, first of all, I find that to be unconscionable. I don't know why you're paying to park on your own school's property. I feel like taxpayer dollars have already covered that cost. Um, that aside, you know, I, I feel like we're being handled, handed uh, a bag of goods from the school district who is not, you know, they're providing political answers. They're not tackling this issue appropriately. And they certainly, in the months that we have been working on this, literally months that we have been working on this, this is the first time we've had the students in here. And you guys come to our, our meetings on a regular basis. This is the first time you all have come here expressing any concern about this because you just found out about it because we passed the first reading of this two weeks ago, right? And for the lack of communication for the school district and your school to not let the parents and the students know about this during this entire process, I'm just incredibly disappointed with that, that communication. I've got a lot more to say, but I'll, I'll hold off for now. I have another question. Give me a So we, we've determined that it would add an extra maybe 750 feet of, of walking. Mm -hmm. So if we would move cars up to that location, what, how many cars can, can be accommodated in those spaces? I don't have the count on that right now, but there's substantial parking there's between that area and all the way up to the CRC. At least so yeah. if there's 100 in the parking lot, then it would take everyone and, and, and add 750 feet to the walk. Yeah. Okay. And would they have to walk? Do they have to walk up and out to the sidewalk, or do they no. walk through the other parking lot? No, there are multiple exits up to the sidewalk. Right. Okay. It's just the balance of the park parking. Yeah. It's what we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. I know where it is. I just <laughs> didn't know. How many, maybe, and I could, couldn't remember how they would get up to yeah, the it's, sidewalk. It's adequate, and there's access to it. Okay. So that's important that there is parking that is available. Yeah. Okay. All right, Zach. Yeah. I, um, I just want to say a few things. And, and Dr. Ron, I couldn't agree with your comments more. Um, I think they were spot on, so I won't uh, belabor them more. What I think, um, I feel for you. I feel for that, you know, you've parked there for years and I think um, you become accustomed to that. We do the math, it's a very short distance. And these are for students that actually drive. There's quite a few students that actually walk the entire way to school or they'll bike to school. So this is, you're already sort of covering that distance from your home to here. So to ask you to walk a little bit farther, um, I don't see as a bridge too far. I think the most important thing is public safety and to daylight, if you will, out of that little pit down there and get everyone up onto street level where we can see in and out of there, I think is the most important thing. Um, you know, anecdotally, I've been in and out of that parking lot. I've seen some of the things that have happened. So I know that um, you're not part of that issue, but I know that that issue and those issues continue to happen at this site. So I think this, um, I don't have a problem moving this forward. And, and my concern is, is, is your safety. I don't want you to become victims if you're down in an area where you know, you're in trouble and it can't be seen. We want you to stay visible so that we can help you for there. So um, if it was 750 yards, I, ha I would pause. But 750 feet, not, not so much. Um, 
you know, it was half a block, half a block maybe to the corner, and then on up the hill to TV. So I don't, I don't have a problem at this point um, moving forward with it. All right. So it's a second reading, so we do have to have a motion. Yes. Uh, you need a motion, but I don't need to read the title. Okay. I, we read Can that I, before we uh, before we move this item. Yes. Just kind of want to say a couple of quick more things. You know, I'd be disappointed if we. Um, just move this thing forward without really thinking about a better solution here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we're, we're trying to encourage all these folks to get more engaged in, you know, local government and their city and all of that. And we enjoy having them here on a, you know, Council Tuesday evening. And, and you know, I, it would have been nice to have a lot more of you come up to the microphone. Not that I want to be here till midnight, but, you know, I'm sure you all have something to say about this. But, you know, we really do want to encourage this. And, and I think it would be kind of disappointing if we left here this evening, listening to all of that, but just going ahead with, you know, the recommendation and business as usual. I think that would be that would be disappointing because then you, you're going to leave here thinking, you know, we spoke, we were listened to, but nothing changed, right? And I just I have a hard time with that. So as proposed, I just can't uh, support this. That said, you know what we're really talking about. This thing won't go into effect for another 30 days if we do vote on this tonight. Um, really, it means that it's not kicking in until next year because the uh, winter break starts sometime 22nd, 22nd, so maybe we're missing out on a week or so. So let's just call this year a wash. We're going to start off the new year and then, you know, have this, uh, 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 you know, change kick in. And we're only talking about roughly five months, right? Um, you know, by my calculation, that's half of what we've you know contemplated as far as security services and everything else I, I, frankly i think we need to do a better job getting the school district to uh, move off of whatever position they have and provide adequate parking and i'm not just talking about it for your school i'm talking about it for every other school because i know the overflow from great oak how many are from great oak high school all right well nobody wants to raise their hand okay sorry um but <laughs> it's cool i wasn't gonna yell um but you know the great oak high school overflows into the local neighborhoods there and i remember a couple of years ago us passing restrictions on parking on the streets there mm -hmm. so the school district is just kind of passing the buck they know they have a parking situation they know they have a problem what other business in town do we let do this mm -hmm. right i mean you know, I mean, they went through the list. You can't park at the, you know, the, the, the restaurant down the street because they won't allow it. You can't park at the church. You can't park at all these places because they have enforcement, mm -hmm. you know. And so why are we just accepting the fact that the school district is just passing the buck on these properties and, and placing burdens solely on us and not doing anything about it? What, what would I mean, you, what would you, you know, do? well, I mean, they, sh they could sure, certainly do a better job with their parking study. They may be able to restripe the parking lots. Have they, you know, contemplated any of that? You know, all of the uh, renewable energy and solar that they did and all that, that was a cost savings to the school district. You, you mean to tell me they couldn't afford a parking study and, you know, roll that money back into uh, making a better parking, you know, for the, for the students there? Come on. There's plenty of options. Why they haven't explored it beyond me, but I think they need to be held accountable. I know our city manager's blood pressure is raising. I can see it. I can feel it in his, his, his cheeks as they get redder. But but honestly, I just I just feel like we're we're doing a disservice here if we just let this go as it is. So what are you so suggesting? My recommendation is one of two things. Maybe we just get an SRO out there for the remainder of the school year. Um, you know, talk about you know what that would be, and maybe tonight here, if we could get a little bit better idea of what the total cost would be. We're talking what maybe an hour to an hour and a half per day, per, you know, I, I don't know if we want to get our SRO here at the, at the mic real quick, if you you're, not be able to. or, or, or Captain McConnell. I don't want to put you guys on the spot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just kind of curious what the cost is and, and whether or not, I mean, I, again, I am not here to, well, there's that guy. He, everybody knows him. Yeah. All right. I well. Hey, see, at least they like you, right? Yeah. So that's cool. All right. So, so if we're talking time-wise, what are, you know? Let's just assume remainder of the school year. How much time would you guys have to spend out there to keep that uh, area safe? First of all, good evening, Council. I'm here with my supervisor, Sergeant Hernandez, and myself, Deputy Curtis Kennedy. I'm also a Golden Bear alumni, class of '97. Go Bears! <laughs> so I have a very vested interest in the school. Uh, 
I think you guys know that. Um, and so I think in regards to maybe the time frame of when we need to be there in the morning, probably about half an hour before school starts, or maybe at 7 in the morning. Um, school starts at 7.30, so I think that would be sufficient. I'm typically there in the afternoon, unless I'm tied up on something at the high school. Um, obviously, that could deal with special needs children and things like that, or what have you. And so I think 30 minutes would be suffice per day be accurate. Can I ask you a question? Yes. So, so Curtis, I see you all the time. Hi. How you doing, ma'am? So in the mornings, where are you typically in the mornings? If you're on campus, what would you typically be doing on campus? So ma'am, my hours are typically from 0, 0730 or uh -huh. 730 in the morning till 330 in the afternoon. Um, and so typically I get to the school around 755 to 8 o'clock in the morning because I have to start in French Valley at the police station. Right. And then by the time I get dressed and get down to the st uh, school, it's approximately 7.55. So are you in the parking lot? Are you at the entrances to the parking lot? Are you all, I mean, uh, with traffic? Are you? Uh, morning hours, typically I'll, I'll do typically a roundabout through Ronald Wiggins Sports Park, if I have time, unless I've been called to uh, to make the Valley High School. I also have Susan H. Nelson, which is the continuation school right. off Pio Pico. So sometimes I get uh, situations that occur there as well. And so typically, I'll drive to the parking lot and make sure our students are safely on campus um, and handle any other situations that may need to be handled. Okay. Depending on the situation, ma'am, but depending on the situation, Curtis will arrive to the school, he'll do his roundabout at the Ronald Reagan Park, and he'll go to his school campus at the Tobacco Valley School. He has a cell phone that's provided by the school. If they're a need for another location, which is the other school he attends to, he'll handle that. The situations or the incidents that has been brought to our attention of the after school situations, it's a two part. If Curtis is involved in a situation in the school building itself, he's not available to go to the park prior to the school's letting out. Also during the lunch hour time frame, Curtis is on the campus during that time frame. So therefore, if the question is how much time would you need to make, to make it safe yeah, for the city exactly. as well as for the students, which we are all involved in about taking care of the students, right. I would say if the school lets out at what time? About 2.30. You would want to have an SRO about 2 o'clock, 2.15, 2 o'clock uh, outside the park prior to the students arriving to the park. And then when the school lets out at 2.30, having them there till approximately 3.15. So there's a, park, a parking lot. And so we're talking about an hour, an hour and a half after school. If you're interested in trying to save something in the morning prior to the school opening up, obviously 7 o'clock, that'll be another hour prior to the school. Mm -hmm. So total cost, if you're looking at it from a cost budget uh, perspective, you're looking at three hours. Did that answer your questions? So are there incidents that happen at lunchtime in that parking lot also? I mean, do, do you have situations uh, like that? From time to time, very rarely, sir. Okay. From time to time, typically that's gonna be our adult population. Okay. Uh, so I get called there because we have parents that frequent the park with their children. Some uh, parents, you know, started having families later in life, so maybe they have a child that's in high school, one's in middle school, one's in elementary school, or maybe one that's not in school yet. Mm -hmm. And so they're frequent in the park and they're seeing activities going on. Sometimes, from time to time, we do have students that unfortunately leave campus during school hours, mm -hmm. and uh, I have to deal with that as well. I mean, is there any opportunity to actually, like if we had an officer there, to clear the parking lot out? So they had a certain time frame by 3.15, these two parking lots had to be empty. I don't know if we could do that. I, well, that's what I was wondering. I don't know if we could do it. It's public parking, so to say it's but empty. But we're, we're able to keep them out with hours. Well, you, but you're talking, yeah, I, I guess so. But in the middle of the day, I don't know. You'll have situations where someone will say, well, I'm waiting for a school activity. I'm waiting for someone else. Oh. There'll be an excuse right. after excuse after excuse. Sure, sure. I um, mean, if you're looking for the safety portion of it, yeah. And you're asking how many hours are we going to have to have an additional SRO there or an additional deputy, regardless be it SRO or deputy. You're looking at tough time frame, I would say roughly 15 to 20 minutes prior to the school. Mm -hmm. And then obviously to that time frame when that flow leaves, mm -hmm. there's going to be, and once the, the students become accustomed that there's an SRO or deputy there, the activity will move somewhere else or will dissipate. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Students like water, take the easiest route. I, yeah, I always did. <laughs> right, yes, Zach. Yeah, so um, I just have a couple more points that I'd like to make. So, you know, I, I think we've heard um, we're removing parking. We're clearly just moving the parking, right? Like, we're not telling you you cannot park there. We're asking you to park just a little bit farther. It daylights it for your safety, for the safety of the community. 
Secondly, it costs nothing. This, we don't have to debate the budgetary constraints of anything. This doesn't cost anything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost the city anything except the, the money we have to pay for the signs to now install there. Um, we already subsidize uh, TVUSD with the SRO program to the tune of half of the program. Is that not correct? Yeah. Yeah, we split the cost for we, all the yeah. SROs. So we split the cost with the 50-50. So we're considering adding on to that another three hours a day for 185 days of the year. Um, so I have a problem with that. Um, we vetted this through the subcommittee. We asked staff to come back with recommendations. Staff came back with recommendations. They're, they're good recommendations. You know, it's not, I don't feel like it's asking too much. I, I completely understand the frustration. I get it. I totally get it. But there still is an option to park just a little bit over. And you're up. You're right along the sidewalk. You don't have to parallel park on Margarita if you don't want to. If you can parallel park, if your parents taught you how to do that, then there's more space on Margarita that you're more than welcome to use. It's striped from Rancho Vista mm -hmm. all the way up to Pava for parking. And it gets used a lot, not during school hours, but it gets used. So I don't, I don't see this as an issue, to be honest with you. I understand, I know we wanna be heard, I get that, um, but sometimes I think we, we've come up with solutions, we've spent the better part of this year coming up with solutions, and I think these are good solutions. All right, Mr. Ron. So, moving this down the road, does this solve the problem? I mean, you know, I, I, the bad actors are still going to be there. They're still going to be causing trouble after school or before school, most likely. Just because it's more visible off of, you know, the main drag doesn't mean that bad people aren't going to be doing bad things. So, how, how, in, your, in your minds, does this help resolve the issue, or are we just shifting at 750 feet down? Sir, to, in my personal opinion, and, and, and based off of what I've seen, I've been in the school office there for quite a while, um, I believe if we move that populace from one area, which was described earlier in the earlier slide, further down uh, the parkway, it's easier for me to observe uh, from Rancho Vista as well as Margarita, uh, as well as, as uh, Councilman uh, Schwank, Schwank. Schwank uh, indicated that um, Margarita is fully available. Uh, there's also a misconception that the uh, neighborhoods directly east of Rancho Vista and Margarita uh, are close to school student parking. That's not the case. It's only directly across uh, near the senior parking lot and the tennis courts where those uh, parking areas mm -hmm. are not allowed. So they are actually allowed to park in the neighborhoods that are directly um, adjacent to Rancho Vista. Uh, I'm sorry, Ronald Reagan Sports Park. Uh, so all those areas are available. So I think if we spread things out a little bit more, not so concentrated, I think it would help with the problem. Okay, and then the other high schools, do we have similar issues with, you know, fights and vandalism, you know, all of those sorts of activities outside of, you know, are we, are we seeing similar levels? Currently, the focus of the problems that we are currently having is at the Beckham Valley High School, unfortunately. There were smaller incidents at Great Oak, rare incidents at Chaparral, but the bulk of what we are seeing our incidents are at that, and that, Ronald Reagan Sport Park, that particular corner of the park. So, so if that's the case, then I, I, I still, you know, again, I'm not saying we're just shifting the problem down because maybe we're not, but if that is the case, I mean, one of the things we often do is we step up patrols and provide additional resources in problem neighborhoods or areas where we don't have issues. So I, regardless of what the decision is on where we do the parking or whatever, I'm still going to advocate for us to spend a little bit more time and resources on law enforcement in that area, um, you know, for at least the next six months, mm -hmm. or you know, through the conclusion of the school year, um, you know, we need to break that cycle of behavior. We need to, you know, provide a, a, a presence that's not putting our staff at risk. Mm -hmm. um, they shouldn't be, you know, policing that area. And and frankly, I don't think private security does the trick um, because I th they can't enforce because they can't enforce. So you know, regardless of what we do, I still say, uh, you know, we need to step up the. Uh, uh, law enforcement presence, and if that means allocating an additional, you know, my estimate now is uh, somewhere between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars. You know, I'd ask that the motion, regardless of you know whether you want to move the parking or not, um, I'd still say that we uh, allocate an additional twelve to fifteen thousand dollars toward uh, additional uh, school resource officers or some law enforcement presence, you know, in those surrounding areas to help alleviate the the concern. So, so Matt, I, I hear what you're saying exactly. 
how about if we do this? How about if we, you know, if, if it's the, the consensus of the majority that we do um, make the cars move the extra 750 feet, can we see how that goes and see if there's a drop in, in uh, you know, any of the hanky-panky that was going on in the corner? And if that's the case, then maybe what you're asking for won't, wouldn't be necessary if they feel like that we've solved the problem. Yeah. So, Aaron, yes. Yeah, just, just um, to Councilman Ron's um, point or request, you know, I, I think what we could consider, oper it's, it's, it's hours, right? We contract yeah. for hours. And so it's not going out and recruiting a new deputy or a new mm -hmm. SRO. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the beauties of being under contract with, for law enforcement. We could consider a kind of a combination of what I heard tonight, which is moving, you know, restricting the parking out of the hole, bringing it up to the street level, um, and also in conjunction with that, you know, assigning some hours, call it three hours a day, you know, a half hour before school, hour and a half, two hours on the back end of the day, um, taking those hours from patrol, taking those hours from overtime. Operationally, we can figure that out. But there would be a significantly high presence of, of black and white in that area, um, assuring that our park patrons are safe, that students are safe walking to and from their car, and that if anything is going to go down, it's going to be nipped in the bud real fast. We could make an intensive effort to do that for s second semester. Call it six months if you want to do that. We could come back here and we could reevaluate or we could give an update and let you know how we did and what we're seeing, um, we'd be willing and, and able to do entertain something like that. I mean, hopefully tomorrow, right? I mean, not that we're going to get it, but, you know, well, we let's, let's get on it. Let's not wait till the start of the next semester. Let's, let's get on it now. Um, might as well, uh, you know, let the presence be known and let them know that this is, you know, these behaviors aren't appropriate. We can do that. I was just tying it to the actual physical move of mm -hmm. relocating cars. That's all. Yeah. Oh, that's right. And so when do we anticipate that? That would take place. It's it's purely up to the city council when you want to um, start this. So the, if the ordinance no, is no the moving of the I mean the getting everything. Well, I, I heard different way. proposals tonight. I heard wait till after the holidays and start January one and call it a second oh, semester okay. rollout. Um, so it's 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 purely at your discretion when you want to enforce this. But what what was also mentioned on day one, we're not going to be sitting there sort of scribbling tickets <laughs> yeah. out either. This is meant to be an education. We're rolling this out. We're working with stakeholders. We'll work with the school district. So um, we're looking for direction tonight on, on when you want to start, how you want to start, and if this, you know, in concert with additional law enforcement presence, then we'll make that happen. So I guess I would recommend, since there are adequate parking spaces in the new area where we're going to move people to, um, and it's 750 feet, which is not, you know, at a minimum. Yeah, at a minimum. And if we step up patrols, I don't I would recommend that we just start right away. It's not going to be that much of a change. I mean, you're going to have to drive up the, you know, towards the sports park a little bit more other than that, and you're going to have to walk a little farther. But other than that, it's really not a change. You're not being forced to try and find a place in a different neighborhood or anything like that. It's ad there's adequate space there. So I would recommend that we start as soon as feasible. Matt? Oh, pretty sure we have to wait 30 days, yeah. though. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. <laughs> just, it takes a just time. So, Can't do it tomorrow. So <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the interim, you know, let's, let's you know, step up the uh, resources there. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm guessing I'm not going to move you guys off the idea of just keeping the parking where it's at. In my, my out, of, out of luck there. What do you mean? Pete? Are you well, I mean, if we're, if we're investing in the SROs and, and, you know, all of that, the whole point is to avoid any conflict and, right. and all of that. So, well, so why don't we just roll this one out beginning of next school year, give the school district a little bit of time to get their act together and find, you know, 64 new parking spots or whatever that number is and hold their feet to the fire. So right? you see, I mean, because we're paying for, I mean, you know, our agreement with the school district is that we pay for half of the school resources you know, that are put on the campus because we choose to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if it's costing the city of Temecula more money in terms of our staff time and oversight and everything else, 
then either we reduce our contribution to their school resource officers and they have to pick up a heftier tab, or they do the right thing and put parking on the school property, mm -hmm. right? I mean, those are the options. So I, you know, I think the message back to the school district, and I'm sure somebody's probably watching this or will watch this, and I'm not endearing myself with, with them right now, but frankly, I don't care. You know, we have a responsibility to provide a safe environment for you know, the folks and the kids going to school. <clears throat> And the school district has a shared responsibility in that. And if they're not going to step up and do the right thing, that clearly they should be working on and, you know, dodging the tough questions, um, you know, then, then I think, you know, we, we uh, you know, let them park where they're parking for the next, you know, for the rest of the school year. And then, you know, start a next school year. We enforce it. We do what we have to do. We provide the school resource officers and that supplement right now. Um, and, you know, start the new school year off fresh, telling them they need to have a plan. They'll have all summer to figure out where to park 65 more cars. So are you suggesting, though, that we immediately start the policing activities? Absolutely. Yes. 100%. Okay. All right. So sort of try to wrap this up. I think that, that going on till next year is cutting the district a little too much slack. If you take this fire and this excitement for being involved to the school board where they have to answer to you. They are your governing board. I feel like that is the space for this. I feel like going to the school district and saying, please figure this out, whether it's restriping or whether it's opening up another lot, that is a huge complex. Can't tell me we can't find 64 spaces to park there was, what, 20-some spaces left, so we're talking 40 spaces on this school site? There has to be space somewhere. Are we sure that they won't say, juniors, you can't drive to school? I can't imagine that they would say that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine they say that. But I feel like this, you know, the school district should be accountable for this. And we're not, again, we're not saying we're, we, you can't park here. We didn't say to you, no, you can't park in a public space. We said please park in a different public space that's safer for you, it's safer for the community. So, I mean, I hate to keep going back, but I just feel like if, if you use this energy and put their feet to the fire, they'll figure it out for you. Guarantee it. That board will figure it out for you. All right, I'm open for suggestions here. What do you guys want to do? I'll move the item as, as a... Second. Moving. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Hang on, before we vote on this, a little personal comment here. All right, so we're moving the item as is, we're not moving parking, but do we have to include in that motion the addition of the uh, school resource Yeah, can officers? we have the motion just stated yeah, let's again clarify clearly the, so we understand? Clarify the motion at least, yeah. Would you like to make the, make the motion? Well, the motion, as I understand it, is to move these cars up to the, the alternative, the alternate location and to provide for how many hours of resource officer? It was three. before school and after school. Okay, before school and not after school. Not to exceed three to four hours a day. Okay, so move to the alternate location and provide for um, officers to um, patrol. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, actually yes. the motion is to adopt uh, ordinance number 1915 that prohibits parking at the, uh, in the hole. Okay. And the effect of that is to move the parking to the alternate location. Then all we and have then, to address is the... And then the second part is, the, is fine. Is the uh, enforcement. Right. Or the patrols. So then I'll move the, I'll move the item and add to that um, added, added patrols or added vigilance for officers. And so what is the effective date of this ordinance? Are we, think, are we talking 30 days? It has to be. It's legally effective 30 mm -hmm. days from today. Okay. Mm -hmm. But with the additional officer effective immediately. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. The additional yeah. hours patrol. And was there a desire to also include um, additional conversation with the school district on behalf of city staff to sort of drill down a little further on available parking yes. in, the, in the longer term? Mm -hmm. Immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Most yep. definitely. All right. So, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, can yes. I please clarify the motion just so I have it for the record? What I understand the motion to be is as presented the adoption of this ordinance according to the second reading 
and then an extra vigilance of patrols mm -hmm. with extra hours, mm -hmm. and then a conversation through the city manager's office with the school district in regards to the parking situation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Been moved and seconded. Mm -hmm. Please vote. So I think it froze. Oh. Um, if, we can, if we can just have a voice vote. Um, Councilmember Edwards? Aye. Councilmember Ron? Aye. Councilmember Schwenk? Aye. Councilmember Stewart? Aye. That passes 4-0. Okay. Thank you. All right. Oh, man. So the city council actually sits on several different boards. One of them is the Temecula Community Service District Board. And we will recess the Temecula City Council meeting in favor of the Temecula Community Service District meeting. Um, Madam Secretary, please note we're all here. Um, any public comments? All right. So we'll move on to the consent calendar. Uh, item number 16 is to approve the action minutes of October 22nd, 2019. Uh, item number 17 is the approved second amendment to the agreement with Advantage Mailing LLC for printing services. Do we have a motion? Move. Uh, I'll second. Okay, it's been moved by um, Mr. Ron and seconded by Mr. Schwank. All right. Yeah, all right. And that's approved 4-0. All right, community services report. Well, Mr. President, I believe uh, Commissioner Levine will cover a lot of our upcoming holiday good stuff in his report, so that concludes my report. Okay. All right, so general manager's report? Nothing tonight. All right. Um, board of directors report? No. Nothing. All right. So we will adjourn the community service district in favor of... Sarda. The uh, SARDA meeting. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, successor agency to the Temecula Redevelopment Agency. Um, please note that we're all here again. Uh, any public comment? All right. So we'll move to the consent calendar. Item number 18 is to approve the action minutes of October 22nd, 2019. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Please vote. And it's froze still? Somebody withdrew the motion. There we go. Passes 4 0, Mr. Mayor. All right, that passes 4 0. Um, any executive director's reports? No. Um, director's reports. I will adjourn the SARDA meeting till December 10th. Temecula Housing Authority, no meeting. I'll just go through to the public hearing. Um, item number 19, receive and file assembly bill AB 1600 financial reports, development impact fee expenditures, and staff report. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, City yes. Council members. I have a brief report for you tonight. The item before you is the summary of the development impact fee expenditures for fiscal year 2018-19. Government Code Section 66006 requires an accounting of the development impact fees be provided at a public hearing every five years. The city has a practice of providing the report annually in order to provide for maximum transparency. Per the Government Code, development impact fee revenues must be spent within a five-year period on eligible capital expenditures that mitigate the impacts of the development activity. For fiscal year 1819, as summarized in this table, a total of 2.2 million in, in development impact fee revenue was collected across the eight separate DIF accounts. Just under 42,000 of interest was earned and a total of $3.3 million were spent across 16 separate capital projects. The remaining development impact fee fund balance for all eight accounts totals $2.8 million and is programmed for expenditure in accordance with the capital improvement program 
adopted by the council on June 11th, 2019. And that concludes my report, and I'm available for any questions. Any questions? No, it looks great. Nothing though. for me. All right. So, does this take a vote? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, this is only a receive and file okay. item, and there are no speakers, so we can move on to the next public hearing. Okay. So, the next uh, item number 20 is conduct public hearing, adopt resolution making certain findings, and adopt ordinance 1913, adopting the 2019 California Fire Code second reading. And I believe we have a staff report. Hi, good evening, um, Mayor Pro Tem and council members. I don't know what my slides are on here, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, this is for the new code adoption cycle for the 2019 California Fire Code that was adopted through the State Fire Marshal's Office. Title 24, Part 9 is the California Fire Code that is adopted by the California State Fire Marshal's Office. This is adopted every three years through the Building Standards Commission. Any changes from the International Fire Code are incorporated into the California Fire Code and then adopted by the state. The city of Temecula has then gone through the state adopted fire code and put into place their local, their local amendments. The city will adopt the California fire code as amended by the state fire marshal's office to go into effect January 1st of 2020. The local amendments that were incorporated are consistent with previous amendments and code adoption cycles that have occurred in the city of Temecula and the office of the fire marshal through Riverside County. The changes in the new code cycle and the new ordinance has been decreased due to the state codes being more thorough in their requirements. This has allowed the fire department to minimize the changes to the ordinance and only require what the state fire code has adopted. Staff recommends that the city council adopt the resolution with the amendments to the California fire code and adopt the ordinance amending the City of Temecula Municipal Code reflecting the 2019 California Fire Code, which has formally been adopted by the California State Fire Marshal's Office. The new proposed ordinance will then go into effect January 1st of 2020. That concludes my presentation for the new code adoption. Do you have any questions? No questions? No. Okay, so I'll open the public hearing. Yes, Mr. Mayor, and we have no public comment, so you are also welcome to close the public and I hearing. Will close the public and hearing. take one motion to go ahead and adopt the resolution and the second reading of the ordinance. Move adoption. Okay. Second. It's been moved by Council Member Edwards and Ron. Please vote. All right. That passes 4-0, so we're on to the next resolution, which is conduct public hearing to adopt resolution, making certain findings, and adopt ordinance 19-14, adopting the 2019 California Building Codes, second reading. Yes, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, before you tonight for consideration is an ordinance adopting the 2019 Building California Building Codes, the adoption of the most current built California Building and Fire Codes is important for the health, safety, and welfare of the community. Enforced by local jurisdictions in the state of California, the Building Codes are reviewed, amended, and adopted by the Building Standards Commission on a three-year code adoption cycle, with the last code adoption taking place in 2016. Local jurisdictions are required to adopt the Building Codes by ordinance on the same three-year cycle. The Building Codes included in the ordinance are Building, Mechanical, plumbing, electrical, administrative, energy, green building standards, historical buildings, existing buildings, residential, and reference standards. The ordinance proposes a few local amendments that are mostly technical in nature. Many of the local amendments in the ordinance are substantially the same as the current municipal code. The 2019 building, California Building Code becomes effective January 1, 2019. With that, staff is recommending the council approve the ordinance as presented. That concludes my presentation. Available for any questions. Any questions? Okay. I will open the public hearing. Any comments? There are none. I will close the public hearing. <laughs> Move approval. Second. 
Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Please vote. All right, we're moving right along. Departmental reports. Um, oh, item number 22 is receiving file. Um, item number 23, Public Works Department monthly report. Also receiving file. Okay, perfect. Uh, commission reports. Nothing tonight, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. All right. Mr. Watts. Yes, we had the uh, eight action items last meeting. Uh, first one was an expansion of Lutheran Church. Turn your mic on, Gary. I mean, Gary, turn your mic on. I'm sorry. Thought I hit it. Uh, Start over again. Right. Uh, we had three items we approved on uh, our last meeting: the expansion of the Lutheran Church on Paba Road, which is uh, expansion on, uh, under their uh, development plan. Uh, the Summers Bend Recreation Center was uh, approved. Uh, it also included a conditional use permit on some bungalows that they're going to be uh, building onto that in that recreation center area. And the third item was a, a conditional use permit for a restaurant, brewery, slash distillery on the corner of Jefferson and Via Montezuma, which will be coming soon. And with that, that's, that's my report. Marijuana. Thank you. Right. Mr. Levine. Marijuana distribution so that's, uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem and City Council, I uh, think we had a brief slide. Yes, we do. Uh, we have great tradition, uh, our holiday tree lighting, Monday, December 1st at 7 p.m. at the Duck Pond. Gosh. Uh, it's here already. And uh, on December 6th, our sig one of our signature events, the Santa's Electric Light Parade at 7 p.m. We hope to see everybody here as well as the community there. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, public safety report. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council members. We uh, responded to 768 emergency responses last month, which included a two-alarm structure fire, the Sycamore Terrace apartment, which was a major incident within the city. Next slide. County Fire Marshal's office, including the city staff that you have assigned to it. Uh, as you can see, their stats for this month of October included an additional 270 plan reviews as well as 268 construction inspections, 188 annual inspections, and 142 over-the-counter public inquiries and working with them. These uh, numbers, as you can see, are pretty, uh, well, I guess we're done with that slide, but as you can look on that slide as you saw before, the year-to-dates when we talk about public, um, talking to them and meeting the public, we're arranging uh, over uh, 3,000, close to 4,200. Next slide. <clears throat> Last month, as you're aware, was uh, a big month for the fire department with our uh, fire safety in October. We had 2,200 contacts with the public, uh, teaching them all the things on public education to fire and fire safety. Next slide. Now that we're rounding into November, our Sparkle Love Tour Drive uh, begins. People can bring their unwrapped new toy to all the fire stations in Temecula, and uh, we will be putting off other toy drop sites on the city website. End of report. Very good. Thank you. Um, city Manager's report. Uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, um, Mayor Nagar left me three slides on his way out, so if we could... Start with the first, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, we want to invite the community out uh, this Friday for P Pachanga Puesca Mountain Day. It's open to the community. It's a free event. Uh, again, this Friday, uh, 1130 to 1. Um, it's an awesome educational event and great community event. Next slide. Um, on Thursday last week, we obviously uh, celebrated the uh, receipt of a $50 million federal grant from the Department of Transportation. This is a group shot of many and not all of the stakeholders and partners that attended our uh, celebration on the rooftop of uh, the garage. Nice and uh, we're grateful uh, for the support that we had and uh, the success we had obviously nationwide 
and this will close the gap on a $136 million French Valley Phase II project. So uh, excited about that. And then lastly, uh, we want to invite the community out, save the date, December 1st, right here at City Hall. It's a Sunday from 2 to 6, free event. I think we have uh, a lot of great food available for the first 1,000 people that show up. Um, there's going to be great music. There's going to be things for kids and family-friendly environment. And sort of the headliner, uh, you might recognize his name, Cody Lee. He was this year's winner of America's Got Talent, and he's bringing his band, and will be performing here at the Civic Center. So uh, we just want everybody to have that on their calendar for December 1. That concludes my report this evening, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. All right. City Attorney. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council, uh, we have one item to report from closed session. Um, the council voted 5-0 to zero to... Uh, retain uh, the city of uh, Temecula's status as a member of the negotiating class in the national prescription opioid litigation uh, in federal district court. All right, thank you. I will take a motion to adjourn. Move adjournment. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Adjourned.